Hello and welcome back to the morgue. Another audio only true crime episode today, but I am in the market for a new camera. <laughs> I have to find a camera that I can connect my mic to. So, I mean, that's an exciting next step in resuming video content for y'all. Last week, we covered the insane back and forth case of the Cam family murders. So I've kind of started to hop back and forth from U.S. cases and other countries. We obviously have a lot of very well-known cases here in America, but I've got to cover everywhere, you know, spread the craziness worldwide. So far, I've covered Scotland and Australia, which like side note, y'all, I've been looking at my stats and like 92% of y'all are in the United States, but I have a couple of listeners in Australia, the UK, France, and Germany. Like, what the hell? I was so excited to see that, you know, the morgue is starting to reach other countries. My brain really just can't compute all of that, I swear, but thank you, everyone, for listening. It truly means the world to me. Also, just a little update, if you don't follow The Morgue Podcast on Instagram, definitely head that way and give a follow. I do upload photos in relation to the cases or haunted content over there, especially because I'm not really doing videos right now. Um, so just if you want to put faces or buildings to the names of the things that we're talking about here, there is a link in the description where you can kind of find, it's like a Beacons AI um, link. And when you click on that, it can direct you to Instagram and YouTube and all that other stuff. So go ahead and give a follow and that's going to kind of push us right into today's case taking a little trip over the pond to England. Welcome, England. You are not going to like being talked about in relation to this case, so sorry in advance. Today, we are covering the UK's killer couple, Fred and Rose West. And holy shit, y'all, it is insane to talk about one person who's a psychopathic serial killer, but like, how do you explain two people who found each other and then do it together? This is just going to be a very long and really hard case to hear, I'm not going to lie. So prepare yourself. Let's talk about it. Frederick Walter Stephen West was born September 29th, 1941 in Much Markle, Herefordshire. Please excuse me if I say any of these locations or names wrong, because honestly, what the fuck are some of these town names in the UK? <laughs> I'm trying. I promise you I'm trying to say them correctly, but I know that I'm not, so sorry. Frederick, or Fred as we will call him, was said to be the first living child of his father, Walter West, and his mother, Daisy Hill. Fred's family was said to be very poor and came from a long line of family farm workers. The family was said to be honestly close-knit and protective of each other. His father was a pretty strict disciplinarian and his mother was very overprotective. I'm assuming because he was the first surviving child, so it kind of sounds like there must have been a few losses for his parents beforehand, which makes sense to them being described as overprotective. When Fred was five, the family moved to Moorcourt Cottage that was next to Moorcourt Farm. Fred's father worked there as a farmhand, and the cottage that they lived in had no electricity and was only heated by a log fire. But honestly, that did not stop them at all. Fred's mother, Daisy, by 1951, was said to have eight more children. That's a lot. <laughs> by 
but only, unfortunately, six of those children survived. It was reported, I guess, that it was pretty well known that Fred was always considered Daisy's favorite, though. Fred was said to be a major mama's boy, which is fine, in all honesty, (laughs) but it was still... said that he did rely on his other siblings for companionship. So, I mean, it doesn't really sound too bad for the now family of nine. But, I mean, it wasn't easy, that's for sure. All of the kids had assigned work that they needed to do. The three girls regularly picked hops and strawberries, depending on the seasons, and the boys harvest wheat and hunted rabbits. This obviously instilled a very strong work ethic in Fred, but also instilled a little bit of thievery too. He knew how hard it was to work and make money, so there were times he just stole what he needed to get by. It was always reported at this time as kind of petty thefts, nothing major. I mean, a theft is a theft, but... It was nothing major. It was really things that he kind of just needed, so he tried to take the easy way out. Now, when it came to school, Fred's classmates would say that Fred was scruffy, dim, and almost lethargic. He had trouble in most classes, but was great in woodworking and art. Fred left school at the age of 15 and became a laborer at the farm with his dad. Fred was said to be illiterate. He didn't really know how to read or write, but didn't really stop him in all honesty. And honestly, all that doesn't sound too bad, right? Wrong. Lola's right here. (laughs) Just kidding. That was a TikTok reference. (laughs) But... Of course, there were some very serious and messed up things that were also going on all throughout Fred's adolescence. By 1957, Fred being 16, his brothers and him would regularly frequent a youth club in nearby Ledbury. Now, it was said that Fred instantly stuck out and was called a country bumpkin. Their words, not mine. And he aggressively messed with the women and girls there. Most of them would kind of just brush him off when he would attempt to approach and fondle them. Ew. But some of the girls would like it, I guess. And when anything moved forward into, you know, the sex department, the girls would say that it was unsatisfying. Now, most men would hate hearing that, but Fred didn't care. He got off and that's all he cared about. Then at the age of 17, Fred got into a very serious motorcycle accident, fractured his skull, arm, and leg. He was in a coma for about a week and once he woke up, he was said to be terrified of the hospital. And then he would start to have fits of rage. Two years after that, he had another serious head injury when he attempted to grope a young woman on a fire escape. And you know what? She wasn't having it. She ended up punching him in the face, which caused Fred to fall two stories. I mean, it kind of sounds like he deserved that, if I'm being honest, but head trauma, you know? Some people think that this is where the issues start to arise from Fred. But I'm going to be honest. I think it was much before this. Fred himself had said, and trigger warning, He had been introduced to sex at the age of 12 by his mother, which led him into acts of bestiality with animals on the farm. He truly thought that bestiality and the incest was completely normal, stating he also saw this happening with his father and his sisters. So the head injury at 17 and 19 was not the only thing to mess him up. I will say, though, Fred's brother openly stated that this was all a lie and his parents never sexually assaulted either any of the kids. But who knows, unfortunately, Fred's traumas could have been different than his siblings. Now, in June 1961, Fred is now 20 if you're keeping up, Fred's 13-year-old sister went to their mom, Daisy, and said that Fred had been sexually assaulting her since December six months prior. And to make it even worse, she was pregnant. Fred was arrested and openly told police, yeah, 
he had been molesting teen girls since his early teens and quote, doesn't everybody do it? No, motherfucker, everybody doesn't do it. He was set to have trial November 9th, and his mom, even though she stated she was disgusted by his actions, was going to testify on his behalf. Unfortunately, on the day of the trial, his young sister stated she would not testify, and the case collapsed, which is absolutely fucked up because they had a full-on confession from him. That alone could have been the end of all of this. Right there. But no would be a very short true crime podcast (laughs) if it did end there i guess he was said to have been disowned by most of the family at that point and the mother would not allow him to come into the house anymore so he ended up staying with his aunt for a short time but by mid 1962 he had kind of rebuilt his relationship with his parents In September 1962, Fred rekindled an old friendship with a woman named Catherine Costello. She went by Raina. He had originally met Raina in a dance hall in 1960, and they dated for a short time, but then Raina had to return home to Scotland. Raina was pregnant at the time that she kind of re-met up with Fred with a bus driver who was an Asian male and stated her family was not supportive of her having a biracial child. She moved from Glasgow, Scotland to England, and Fred and her married very quickly, November 17th, 1962, so a month later. The only person who attended the wedding was Fred's younger brother. The couple originally lived with Fred's aunt, but then moved to Coatbridge, where Fred worked as an ice cream truck driver, The absolute worst thing imaginable for him to be working, since we know he's a fucking creep. Raina's daughter, Charmaine, was born in March 1963. Obviously, people could tell that Fred was not the father due to her being half Asian, and so they told people the original baby Raina was pregnant with had died and they adopted Charmaine. The couple soon after moved to the Bridgeton district of Glasgow. Does that ring a bell to anybody? I swear I didn't even realize that this was a thing in this case until halfway through my research. But if you don't know, go listen to my very first episode, Bible John, and you will get it. Now, in July 1964, Raina had another child. This one was Fred's, obviously, and they named her Anna Marie. The family had a nanny at this time, too, who said that Raina was a very good mom, but did struggle raising the two children, and that Fred treated the children very harshly. Harshly is a fucking understatement. Fred basically made cages on the girls' bunk beds, and they were only allowed out of the beds, cages, when he was at work. Fred was said to be very unfaithful at the beginning of this marriage, even having a child with one woman he was having an affair with. Once Raina found out, she chose to start up a relationship of her own with a man named John McLaughlin. Fred ended up seeing Raina and John in an embrace, is how it was described. (laughs) And he punched Raina in the face. She started yelling, obviously, and then John punched Fred. At that point, Fred backed up, pulled out a pocket knife, and tried to stab John, slicing him in the chest. John got another punch on Fred, thankfully, and Fred backed off. Years later, John stated, quote, he couldn't tackle a man, but he wasn't so slow attacking a woman. Regardless of all of this, John stuck around and continued the affair with Raina. At one point, noticing that Fred had very clearly beaten her, Fred got himself yet another beating from John. And then another instance when Charmaine, maybe around a toddler's age, asked Fred for an ice cream from the truck. Fred hit her in the head. John also beat the shit out of Fred again. So he's... Yes, involved in an affair, but he's really trying to protect Raina and Charmaine. Then in November 1965, Fred got into an accident where he accidentally ran over a small boy in Glasgow in his ice cream truck. 
He was cleared of any wrongdoing, but the town did not like him after that, in all honesty. So he decided to up and move back to England with Charmaine and Anna Marie. They moved to Gloucester and rented a caravan in a motorhome park. Raina ended up coming down south to be with him in February 1966. And she brought two of her friends and neighbors, Isa McNeil and Anne McFall. Isa and Anne hoped to move to England and find better work for themselves, but of course, Fred very quickly showed dominance and control over all three women. He was very prone to abuse against the women, but Raina and Isa got the worst of it. He was said to have been sexually abusing Charmaine at this time too, and pushed Raina to start being a sex worker to supplement his income. Raina and Isa then made a plan on how they can get themselves and the kids out of this situation. Raina called John and told him everything and stated she needed help. Isa also called her boyfriend and altogether they made a plan on how to escape with Raina and the young girls. By this point, Anne had become infatuated with Fred though and she was thought to have kind of tipped him off on the whole escape plan. John and Isa's boyfriend, his name was also John, John Trotter, um, came down and Fred was waiting on them. A huge fight ensued and the police were called. Raina, Isa, and the Johns all ended up leaving. Fred and Anne keeping the girls and Fred told Raina he would kill her if she ever came back. He didn't really keep up with that threat, though, in the beginning, thankfully, because Raina and Isa would come and see the girls and check on their well-being. Raina began to get very mad, though, at Anne because she basically started to act like the girl's mom, which Raina was not having, and I don't blame her. Anne did send letters home to her family in Scotland and say she believed Fred could offer her a better life, and at the same time, trying to convince Fred to legally divorce Raina and marry her instead. Raina would hop back and forth living with Fred again and then moving back to Glasgow at this time. By July 1976, Anne McFall was now 18 years old and eight months pregnant with Fred's child. I think I forgot to mention that she was a fucking child herself, but July, Anne vanished. She was never reported missing of course, either. A month later, Raina was back living with Fred. The relationship was, of course, short-lived, and Raina left again the next year, leaving the girls with Fred. This leads us right up into 1969. Fred was 28 years old, and he met a girl while waiting for the same bus in Cheltenheim. Cheltenham? I don't know how that's pronounced. <laughs> Rosemary Pauline Letts was born November 29th, 1953 to Bill Letts and Daisy Fuller. Crazy to me that both of their mom's names were Daisy, but anyways. Rose's family was again said to be very poor and Rose was the fifth of seven children. Daisy was said to have suffered with depression and was giving electroconvulsion therapy while pregnant. I'm sorry, but they had to have known that that was not a good idea. Like, what? Anyways, there is a lot less known about Rose's upbringing in comparison to Fred's, if I'm being honest, but Rose's parents were said to have divorced when she was a teenager. She lived with her mother for six months and then moved with her father at 16 years old. Her father reportedly suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and would have very extreme violent outbursts and, of course, repeatedly sexually abused Rose and her older sister. But before that, around the time Rose hit puberty, Rose seemed to have been fascinated by her body, which there's nothing wrong with that. A woman's body is wild, especially at those times, and you begin to have a lot of questions. But she would kind of parade around naked a lot in front of her dad and her younger brothers. Then it's reported on multiple occasions she would sneak into her brother's room and begin molesting him and her other brother. Obviously, she didn't learn that out of nowhere, but it's still wrong. Those poor boys, and I hope they grew up okay. Well, that's about all we know about her upbringing, and at 15, so right at her parents' divorce, she met Fred at a bus stop. 
Initially, it was said that she was disgusted by Fred. He seemed grimy and that he didn't take care of himself. But then she became flattered by all of the attention he was giving her. Fred obviously took a liking because he's a fucking creep and began to sit next to Rose at the bus stop and continuously asked her on dates. Rose said no twice, but then allowed him to accompany her home. Fred then found out that Rose worked at a nearby bread shop, so he asked a random lady to go inside and bring Rose a gift and tell her it was from a man outside. The unknown woman did it. I guess she didn't notice the fucking age gap. And then Fred came in shortly after to ask Rose on a date again. This time, she said yes. The relationship was pretty much set that point forward. Rose always coming back to the motorhome park with Fred. Fred definitely noticed that even though Rose had never had an actual boyfriend, she was very ready to talk about sex. And then he also tried to kind of guilt her into the fact that his wife had left him and he wanted more children and somebody to help with his girls. Once she had met the girls, Rose was more than willing to help out with them, of course, because she was being groomed. (laughs) She noticed the girls were neglected and at first was very caring and affectionate with them, telling Fred they needed to take the girls out to gather wildflowers more often. Rose ended up quitting at the bread shop to stay with Fred and be a nanny to the girls. She told Fred he needed to pay her every Friday so that her parents didn't know that she had quit, and that's exactly what they did, for a couple months at least. And then Rose decided it was time to introduce Fred to her parents. Daisy and Bill hated him. Rightly so. Daisy stating that he was, one, very dirty looking, and very clearly a pathological liar. My God, did she hit the nail on the head with that one. And Bill was really focusing on the fact that he was fucking 27, and his daughter was 15. He believed wholeheartedly that Fred had molested her, even threatened to call social services on Fred if he didn't leave Rose alone. Rose and Fred did not care one bit, and that prompted Rose's parents to go and tell social services what was going on. Rose was placed in a home for troubled teens and would only be able to come visit her parents every now and then. She almost always snuck out and went to see Fred. When Rose was 16, she was let out of the home and moved back in with her parents. That was until Fred got out of jail. Just on theft charges and unpaid fines, he didn't actually get charged for the sexual offenses because that never happens. <laughs> Rose immediately left her parents' home and moved into Fred's new apartment in Cheltenham. Fred was able to get custody of his daughters again, Charmaine and Anna Marie, after his jail sentence. And Rose's dad, Bill, tried one more time to forbid Rose from seeing Fred. Rose was then examined by a police surgeon. I'm not sure what that is, if I'm being honest. But it was determined that Rose was pregnant. At that point, Rose was placed again into social services custody and was released a couple months later, agreeing that she would terminate the pregnancy and return to live with her parents. Instead, Rose went to live with Fred again, and Bill basically cut all ties with her, telling her she could never return to the home. Fred and Rose moved to a new home in Midland Road, And in October 1970, Rose gave birth to a new daughter, Heather Ann. There is a little speculation that Heather Ann was actually Rose's dad's kid, but God only knows with these people, if I'm being honest. Fred was sent back to jail at this time for stealing car tires and some other, again, unpaid fines, and was in jail for about six months. Coming back home to Rose and the kids, June 1971. Rose had just turned 17, but looked after the girls and began telling Charmaine and Anna Marie that they needed to call her mom. Anna Marie would later say that even though in the beginning Rose was kind and caring to the girls, she definitely took a turn, stating that her and Charmaine were constantly criticized, took horrible beatings, and had many different forms of punishments while Rose was watching them. Anna Marie was said to be very submissive and honestly cried a lot during this time. She was a very emotional child, as she should be. 
and I guess Rose felt more power over her. Now, Charmaine was said to have refused to show emotion and was described as very stoic during the beatings and abuse. She was not going to let Rose break her, which in turn infuriated Rose. Charmaine definitely took the brunt of the beatings after a short time, but Anna Marie stated that she would never lose hope, telling her on many occasions that mommy will come and save me. Now, Anna Marie also said that Charmaine would almost taunt Rose, talking about things her real mom would never do, like cuss in front of them or shout. But even if Charmaine did do this, she did not deserve all that happened to her at the hand of Rose. An upstairs neighbor who was a friend of the girls later reported that one time she came downstairs to go and see Charmaine and Anna Marie unannounced. And when she walked into the home, she saw Charmaine naked, standing on a chair, gagged, and had her hands tied behind her back with a belt. And Rose was standing next to her with a large wooden spoon in her hand. The neighbor girl stated that Charmaine looked calm and really just unbothered. And Anna Marie was in the corner scared with a very blank expression on her face. It's unknown if this neighbor said anything to anybody, but it didn't change anything. Charmaine had also been brought to the hospital in March of 1971 to get treatment for a severe puncture wound to the, her left ankle. Rose, of course, told doctors that this was just a form of a household accident. Like, what, bitch? <laughs> what household accident? Why did no one ask any more questions? Now, I'm going to begin to go over all of the murders and sexual assaults. I'm going to tell them in order, even though police had no idea about any of these at the beginning. So just try and stay with me because it is going to get rough, but it is important to remember these victims. We are going to go back a little to what is believed to be Fred's first murder. And I'm sure you can guess who it was. Anne McFall. I stated that she vanished back in July 1967, but was never reported missing. Fred stated later in life that he and Anne got into an argument one night and he stabbed her to death. But when her remains were found in June 1994, yes, 27 years after she disappeared, she was found to have a cord wrapped around her wrist, leading police to believe that she was bound prior to death. Anne was found dismembered and buried at the edge of a cornfield between Much Markle and Kempley. They also noted some of her bones were missing and they believed they were kept as keepsakes. They also stated, and trigger warning again, that they believe her unborn baby was cut from her womb. I don't believe they ever found the infant's body. So we're going to snap right back to June 1971. Fred was in jail at this time for his tire thefts, and it was said that June 15th, Rose, Charmaine, Anna Marie, and Heather Ann all visited Fred in jail that day. Now, it is believed shortly after this, before Fred was released June 24th, that the neighbors upstairs and even Anna Marie began asking where Charmaine was. Rose stated that her mother, Raina, had come back to pick her up and she lived with her in Bristol now. Anna Marie was very confused and sad why her mom didn't come for her too. And when her father was released, she finally asked him, which he told her, she wouldn't want you, love. You're the wrong color. Remember that Charmaine was half Asian, and it seemed like Fred began to have an issue with that too because he's a piece of shit. It's believed Rose killed Charmaine in the week between visiting Fred in jail and him coming home. Rose originally put Charmaine's body in the coal cellar of the home, and when Fred came home, she told him, and he proceeded to bury her naked body in the backyard near the back door. Fred did state he did not dismember her, but a later autopsy would show that she was also missing some bones and that it seemed like she had been severed at the hip joint. Fred stated that the hip damage may have been from when he built some shit on the property in 1976. I doubt it, but whatever. Obviously, the missing bones are going to be a theme that police notice later in all of the murders, so keep that in mind. Then, in August 1971, two months later, Raina had become very worried about the girl's well-being. 
It was said that she did try and visit a lot and always kept in contact with the girls. I'm assuming once Charmaine was killed, Fred and Rose cut all contact with Raina so that Anna Marie wouldn't ask her how Charmaine is doing. Obviously, she thought she was with her mom. Well, Raina decided to make a trip down to Fred and Rose's home to check on the girls. Raina's sister later stating that Raina was very depressed and extremely anxious about the girls' welfare. She found out where Fred was living and headed straight down there. That was the last time that she was ever seen alive. It is believed that Raina was strangled in the back of Fred's car and was likely intoxicated at this time. When police found her remains, she was buried with a short metal tube. Police believed she was restrained and possibly sexually assaulted, then strangled. Her body was extensively dismembered and placed into bags and then buried about a mile from Much Markle. After this murder, Fred and Rose decided it was time to celebrate, I guess, and got married January 29th, 1972. No family other than Fred's brother, John, was invited to the wedding. Mind you, Fred never actually legally divorced Raina, but they signed the certificate and went on their way. Rose then got pregnant with their second child, and they moved into a new three-story home off of Cromwell Street. They initially rented it from council, which, to my understanding, is like state's assistance here in the United States. But Fred ended up buying the property from the council for 7,000 pounds. Now, to help out with rent, Fred decided to convert the upstairs into basically apartments so he could rent them out. And he made like a little washroom and kitchen area up there so the tenants didn't need to come to the first floor where the family lived. The tenants were also not allowed in the backyard. As you can imagine, Fred wanted his privacy. June 1st, 1972, the couple had another baby girl, and they named her May June. After Rose had the second child, she then began to engage in sex work. She would have her clients come to the home and use one of the rooms upstairs. She advertised her services in a local magazine. Fred encouraged this, obviously, and this led to Rose also engaging in just casual sex. Let me say, there was nothing casual about this. I ain't here to kink shame, but it obviously gets wild. Rose began having sex with anyone, male or female, and would mostly tell people that no man or woman could ever satisfy her. When Rose would have sex with women, she began to gradually increase her brutality, like suffocation, the inserting of large dildos into them, and if the woman would show any pain or discomfort, she'd taunt them by saying, what, aren't you woman enough to take it? Obviously, Fred wasn't going to let Rose have all the sex, and by sex, I mean very clearly fucking torture on people. So he would regularly join in. The couple had a lot of threesomes and the victims would state, because that's what they are, fucking victims and not clients anymore at this point. But the victims would state that they would try to take women beyond their sexual limits. Then that's when bondage got involved. The West stated they took a lot of pleasure from establishing a strong level of dominance, pain, and violence over their partners. They began to collect a ton of bondage equipment, restraining devices, magazines, and photographs. The photographs only grew into more and more horrible shit, like bestiality and child pornography with a lot of child sex abuse. Rose's room is what they called the room she had upstairs for her clients. It had a bar and a red light on the outside of it when she didn't want to be disturbed, but... Fred obviously made some peepholes so that he could watch and even added a baby monitor in the room so he can listen wherever he was inside the house. Rose made a lot of money doing this and honestly took over all of the finances at this time. A lot of money went into home improvements, but God only knows what the West considered improvements. Rose's father ended up kind of coming around and him and Fred began to have a relationship. They opened up a cafe together called the Green Lantern, but it crashed and burned. Then Bill found out about Rose's form of income, and I'm sure you're assuming he was pissed. 
Nope. This case only gets more and more fucked up. He supported his daughter. And not in like the, I understand that you're doing this for money and we'll, and we will always support you. But became a fucking client of hers. Yeah, her dad would have sex with her. I want to throw up just saying that. Rose then became pregnant again and again. And by 1983, she had given birth to eight more children. Some of them being Fred's, some of them being clients' children. But Fred didn't care and took them in as his own, telling some of the children that their skin was a little darker because their grandmother was, insert whatever race the child was. Once all of the children would reach the age of seven, they all had chores they were expected to help out with around the home. They were also not allowed to hang out outside of the home unless one of the parents were present. If they didn't listen to the house rules, they were severely beaten. Rose doing the vast majority of the beatings. Between 1972 and 1992, the West children were taken to the hospital a total of 31 times. The injuries were always reported as accidents and never reported to anyone. Sexual assaults on the children were also common. Anna Marie getting a lot of it, where Rose would tell her to undress, and if she didn't do it quick enough, Rose would rip the clothes off of her, and Fred would assault her. Fred would tell her, I'm sorry, everybody does it to every girl. It's a father's job. Don't worry and don't say anything to anybody. How absolutely fucked up. That poor girl, y'all. It gets so much worse for Anna Marie having to begin sex work at the age of 13 and so much worse, but I just really can't bring myself to say it all. Just know this girl is fucking strong and made it out of it all. In October of 1972, jumping back again, the West met a young 17-year-old girl, Caroline Owens. She had been hitchhiking and the West picked her up and learned that she hated her stepfather and was looking for a job. The West took this opportunity to ask her to come be a part-time nanny for their three children at that time. Caroline agreed almost instantly. She moved into the home and stayed in a room with Anna Marie, who she stated was very withdrawn. If she only freaking knew what that child was going through. Caroline stated that Fred began to express his sexual intentions with her. She then told the couple that she wanted to get the hell out of there. At that point, she left, and Fred and Rose made a plan to abduct her and murder her. They knew she frequently hitchhiked, so they found Caroline in December 1972 and lured her into the vehicle, stating that they wanted to apologize to her for the way that they acted and offered her a lift home. She believed that they were being sincere and got into the car, Rose entering the back seat with her. Rose began to fondle Caroline and she obviously resisted them. Fred stopped the car and punched Caroline in the face, calling her a bitch. Caroline was knocked unconscious and Rose bound and gagged her until they returned home where they gave her a cup of tea that had been drugged. Caroline woke up in Rose's room and was sexually assaulted and tortured for hours. She realized if she screamed or fought in any way, the abuse just got worse, so she tried to stay calm in hopes that they would let her go. Fred threatened to murder her multiple times and then told her she was only there for Rose, then asked her if she would reconsider being a nanny for the family. Caroline knew that this was her way out, so she agreed, stating that she would become a part of the family. She was let out of the room and began helping out around the house until she finally found her escape. Carolyn ran out of the home and made it back to her house, at first scared to tell her mom about what had happened, but her mom obviously saw all of the welts and cuts on her daughter. They reported the entire ordeal to the police, and Fred and Rose were immediately charged and arrested on charges of assault, indecent assault, actual bodily harm, and rape. The case was tried January 1973, but Caroline decided not to testify. Because of this, all of the charges pertaining her sexual assault were dropped. 
The West pled guilty to assault and causing bodily harm, and each fined 50 pounds and were able to walk free from court that day. Caroline heard about the news and attempted suicide. Thankfully, she did survive the attempt. Three months later, the West met Linda Go through a male lodger that would frequent their home. On April 19th, Linda decided to move in to the home after she had been coming and going and staying with two males that stayed there frequently. The next day, she was gone. The West told the other people living in the home that they had kicked her out due to Linda hitting one of the children. It is believed that the night of April 19th, Linda was brought down to the cellar of the home where the abuse began. Linda was believed to have been suspended from the ceilings and likely died of strangulation or suffocation. Linda's body was found dismembered with tape across her nose and mouth, but they had placed tubes in in her nasal cavities so that she would be able to breathe, just not scream. She also was found to have missing bones. Carol Ann Cooper was a 15-year-old and was abducted November 19, 1973. She was believed to have been picked up by the West after having been to a movie with her boyfriend that night, and Carol was living at a local children's home at the time and had been waiting at a bus stop when she vanished. She was likely dragged into Fred's car and bound with braided cloth, and then they covered her face with surgical tape. Carol was also brought back to the West Cellar, suspended from the ceiling, and met the same form of abuse as Linda, to have then been killed, dismembered, and buried in a shallow grave in the cellar floor. Over the following 17 months, three more victims had been brought back to the West's home and suffered the same or worse abuse than Linda and Carol. They are not really documented on, but... This is what I was able to find. Lucy Partington, 21 years old, was last seen at a bus stop and believed to have been abducted and killed December 1973. She was found later buried in the cellar. Therese Seigenteller, also 21 years old, was abducted while hitchhiking in 1974. They found her body under an extension built by Fred at the home. Shirley Hubbard, 15 years old, abducted from a bus stop in November 1974. Her remains were also found in the cellar. Juanita Mott, 18 years old, and she was a former resident here and there at the home. She was last seen April 1975, and her body was found buried on the property. After Juanita, Fred, I guess, ran out of room in the cellar floor and decided to cover the whole floor in concrete. He was obviously not trying to get caught, and that's a smart way to try and cover up anything, in all honesty. He was said to have then converted the cellar into a bedroom for his oldest kids. Fucking sicko. The couple seemed to take a break for a short time. That was until Fred met Shirley Robinson, an 18-year-old who was again staying in one of the upstairs rooms at the home. It is unknown if Rose helped with this one, but she definitely knew about it either way. Shirley was said to have been very, very pregnant at the time of her murder. Now, I say Rose knew about it because I guess at the beginning, Rose was boasting around saying that Shirley's baby was actually Fred's, then turned around and started to resent Shirley. Police believe that Rose told Fred to handle it, and he killed her. Shirley's baby was also cut out of her womb, and bones were missing from the both of them. Shirley was dismembered and buried in the backyard. No restraining devices were found buried with or on Shirley, so they don't think that this was actually any sexual motive for Fred at this time, further leading to their belief that Rose was just jealous of Shirley. Then, mid-1979, the Wests met Allison Chambers, who had left a children's home in town and agreed to be a live-in nanny for the Wests. Allison was believed to have lived in the home for several weeks before she was ultimately murdered. Rose had told Allison she could come and live on a peaceful family farm they owned, but obviously that wasn't true, so I wonder after a couple of weeks if Allison began to realize there was no farm, and that's when they knew it was kind of over and killed her. 
Her body was also buried in the backyard of the home. Police believe she was also dismembered, but they didn't find any marks or ropes found on her body like the earlier victims. Now, Allison did have family who she had stayed in contact with, and so Fred and Rose thought to send the mother a letter they had Allison actually write about a month prior to her murder. I'm assuming the letter explained why they would not be hearing from Allison anymore, but we don't know for sure. Now, unfortunately, we are going to head back to the West's own children, Heather West, who did complain to friends about the abuse she and her siblings endured at home. The friends stating later that they did notice all of the signs of distress Heather was showing, but they were all kids, you know. Staff also expressed concerns. They noticed Heather was normally a very good student and very obedient, but would not listen when they were told to change clothes or shower after playing sports at school, which was very common back in the day. One time, she was forced to shower after a sporting event, and her peers and staff noticed all of the bruises and welts in various stages of healing, showing this is a constant and has been going on for a while. She told staff that this was just from fighting with her siblings, but did tell one of her friends in private that this was from her parents. Heather left school in 1986 and immediately applied to jobs to be able to leave the home and all of the abuse. She applied to be a house cleaner at a holiday camp near the beach, but on June 18, 1987, she received a notice that she did not get the job. Her siblings later said that they heard her crying all night long, but the next morning she seemed to be back to her normal, which her normal was swaying back and forth on the couch, biting her nails till they bled, looking miserable. The siblings left for school, and that was the last time they saw her. Once they returned home, they asked Fred and Rose where Heather was, which they responded the job had actually called her back and offered her it full time, and she had up and left. When later Heather didn't contact any of her siblings, they asked the parents why, which Rose stated that she'd eloped with a lesbian lover and didn't care to contact them anymore. In the years following her disappearance, Fred would jokingly threaten the children, saying if they misbehaved or didn't listen, they would end up under the patio like Heather. Fred later built a barbecue pit next to where Heather was buried and put a pine table on her grave, if you can call it that, so that when the family went out back, they would essentially be sitting on her. Because Fred and Rose never kept their story straight, the police got involved and executed a search warrant in 1994, where they began to search the backyard. Actually, though, the police did get involved two years prior. Fucking finally. In May 1992, Fred told his 13-year-old daughter, Louise, to bring some bottles to a room in the house. Rose was not there at this time. Shortly after, the other siblings heard Louise scream, No, don't. And then a little later, Fred came out of the room. The siblings went into the room and found Louise in so much pain, crying, saying that Fred had raped and sodomized her and had almost strangled her. Rose then came home and Louise told her everything. Rose's reaction, you ask? She said, oh, well, you were asking for it. Mom of the fucking year. I hate them. Y'all, I hate them. The sexual assaults on Louise continued for the next couple of weeks. Rose began to watch this happen and would follow her hurt and bleeding daughter into the bathroom and would say things like, well, what did you expect? Fred even filmed one of the assaults. Finally, Louise told one of her friends what had been happening the last couple months, and that friend in turn told her mother, who anonymously informed the police. August 6, 1992, the police searched the West's home under the pretext of searching for stolen property. They found all of the sexual objects and 99 pornographic videos, both homemade and professionally made porns. But not the one of Fred's assault on Luis. The 13-year-old made a full statement. She told the police every single detail and that the sexual abuse had actually begun when she was 11, also stating her mom just didn't care at all. 
All of the kids were placed into foster care the very next day, and medical examination showed proof of sexual and physical abuse. All the children stated their mother caused a majority of the physical abuse and that their father would always say if they told anyone about what was happening in the home, they would be buried under the patio like Heather. Police started a full-fledged investigation at this time, charging Fred with three counts of rape and one count of sodomy, and Rose was charged as an accomplice. Well, she did have some of her own charges, but they focused on the physical abuse, child cruelty, and inciting her husband to sexually abuse their daughter. The Wests were both questioned separately by police on the whereabouts of Heather, Fred stating she was alive and well and supporting herself via sex work. Rose initially said she had no idea where Heather was, but that she had left on her own accord. Then later stated that she remembered that Heather left the home because Rose was concerned that the other kids would find out that Heather was a lesbian. She then offered her daughter 600 pounds to leave the home, but talks to her sporadically over the last couple years. As they were awaiting trial, Fred, of course, denied everything, but Anna Marie found out about all of this that was going on. She had left by this point. Anna Marie then contacted police. She told them after she heard her younger sister, Louise, had told them everything, she wanted to share what had happened to her, all of the sexual, mental, and physical abuse. She also agreed to testify against the both of them, thankfully. Anna Marie also claimed for years she had been trying to contact her mother, Raina, and her two sisters, Charmaine and Heather, but could not ever find them. Anna Marie's husband told police that they had actually talked to Heather before she disappeared, and she said just how unhappy she was and that she wanted to leave. She never said anything about the sexual abuse to him, but he was worried about her well-being and said he was going to confront Fred and Rose, which Heather got upset and stated, for Christ's sakes, don't. They will kill us both. The husband then told police that they should really try and trace down Heather and talk to her about all of the abuse. The other daughter, May, was said to have talked to Luis, and Luis stated that she didn't want to see her dad charged. So May told police that she was never assaulted. Police didn't believe her, but couldn't make her be a victim. Police then focused on finding Heather, which they hit dead end after dead end. Police realized that looking for Heather in the inland revenue, I'm assuming is the IRS, kind of like the same thing, and Social Security Department, that they had no record showing that Heather was even still alive. And if she was, she was so far under the radar, there was no hope in contacting her. Then, two months later, social services contacted the police to stress their own concerns on where the hell Heather was. June 7th, 1993, the case against the Wests fell apart. Luis and Anna Marie both stating that they would no longer testify. Luis stating she wanted to go back home with her family. And Anna Marie stating she didn't want Rose to hurt them even more after all of this. She did still push police to look into where Raina and Charmaine were, alongside of Heather. The Wests were acquitted of all charges, but police were not backing down. All of the younger children were kept in foster care, and the parents could only see them under very strict, supervised visits. All of the relatives of Fred and Rose cut all ties to the family. Police were now looking at the disappearance of Heather as a murder. Anna Marie also stating she did hear her dad say that he would bury the other kids under the patio, but laughed after, so she thought it was a joke. They also noted that Raina and Charmaine disappeared in 1971, but neither person was ever reported missing, so there's another red flag. Police thought the claims of the patio were maybe true, and February 23rd, 1994 successfully got a search warrant authorizing them to search the property for Heather's remains. Police arrived to the home that same day and showed Rose the warrant. She was said to have turned completely white and yelled for her oldest son to get Fred. Fred was working and came home about three hours later trying to tell police new stories about where Heather was and that the patio thing was just a joke but they didn't believe him at all. 
They began mapping the excavation all out and left officers at the residence overnight. The entire search team came back the next morning, and it seemed like Fred had a change of heart. He walked up to one of the officers and claimed he wanted to confess to the murder of Heather and requested to be taken to the police station. Fred reportedly told his son to take care of Rose and sell the house, also telling him he did something really bad and wanted the son to go to the papers and make as much money as possible. Fred provided a full confession and was formally charged and arrested. He told them they were digging in the wrong area and pointed police to the location of Heather's remains. After a short time, they started to find the remains. He told them he had strangled her in a fit of rage and then dismembered her with a large knife in the cellar. They found the fingernails in a a pile seemingly torn off to torture her, and they were able to identify her via dental records. Heather West was found, but upon finding Heather's remains, trying to piece her back together in all honesty, police realized something was off. They found a third thigh bone, obviously not Heather's. When they asked Fred, he said that they were right. He had murdered two other women, Shirley Robinson, a tenant of theirs, and Shirley's mate, he called the other woman. The other woman was not Shirley's girlfriend, but the bodies were discovered and Fred was charged with an additional two murders. At this point, the police decided they needed to dig up everything. They weren't sure how many people were actually buried here. They placed Rose in a safe house where she was basically guarded while they searched and questioned up to 16 hours a day. Fred ended up passing a note to his lawyer during one of his questionings in regards to the whereabouts of his ex-wife, Raina, and the lawyer passed the note to the lead investigator. The note said, I, Frederick West, authorize my solicitor, Howard Ogden, to advise Superintendent Bennett that I wish to admit further approximately nine killings. Expressly, Charmaine, Raina, Linda Go, and others to be identified. Signed, F. West. The police knew it, and Fred began to explain that there were five more bodies buried in the cellar, and a sixth body underneath the ground floor bathroom. He claimed most of his victims had been hitchhikers, and he only killed them because he didn't want Rose to find out about what he was doing. He'd bring them back to the cellar, torture them, kill them, and dismember and bury them. He said he only dismembered them because it made it easier to bury them in small cubicle graves. Fred went back to the home with police and showed them exactly where all the bodies were buried. Police found all six bodies between March 5th and 8th stating all of the women had been extensively mutilated and that they had evidence of extreme sexual abuse. Every single body was missing bones, and Fred refused to tell them where they were. I guess he felt like he had told them enough, because he's a piece of shit. (laughs) Fred tried to say that Rose had no idea about any of this, but police again knew that they were both full of shit. After more questioning, In regards to Rose raping an 11-year-old girl in the 1970s and then a physical assault of an 8-year-old boy, she was charged and was refused bail. By May 6th, Fred and Rose were jointly charged with five counts of murder. Rose simply said, I'm innocent, after each count was read to her. Fred confessed to the murder of his ex-wife and stepdaughter and said he knew where Anne McFall's remains were, but he stated he did not murder her. Raina, Charmaine, and Anne's remains were unearthed between April 10th and June 7th. Fred was sent to Birmingham's prison and was on a strict suicide watch, where he had to be checked on every 15 minutes. Fred and Rose were formally charged June 30th, 1994. Fred with 11 murders and Rose with 9. Fred was charged with Anne McFall's murder a few days later once they finally were able to identify her remains. Rose then just seemed to hate Fred. They saw each other at the formal charge hearing, and Fred 
placed his hand on her shoulder and she visibly winced in discomfort. He was said to become very depressed because she would not return any of his letters or when Anna Marie and his son began to visit him, he would tell them to tell Rose that he loved her, but she would never say it back. After that, Fred decided he was done saying that Rose had no part in the murders and told police she of course knew about them all along and helped with many, except Anne McFall. He said Raina actually did that one. The suicide watch was relaxed on Fred, and January 1st, 1995, Fred was found dead in his cell. He apparently hung himself with a blanket and some laundry bags. He left a suicide note, but honestly, I don't care what he had to say. You can Google it yourself if you're interested. Sorry, but this man deserves no mercy in my opinion. (laughs) Rose's trial on 10 counts of murder, Charmaine was added later began October 3rd, 1995. After seven weeks of evidence, the judge sent the jury away for deliberations. The jury came back on November 22nd and returned unanimous guilty verdicts on all 10 counts, saying her crimes were appalling and depraved. She was sentenced to life in prison and the judge emphasizing she should never be let out on parole. She is still in prison at H.M. Prison, Newhall. Now, police think that there are more victims out there. Fred even saying himself the number is closer to 30, so 18 undiscovered before his death. They were able to link four murders to Fred in Gloucestershire when Fred lived in Glasgow, Scotland. The survived children have all tried to move on with life after all of this. They had a small burial for their father and Anna Marie even writing a book about everything. Fred's younger brother was actually charged with raping Anna Marie when, and while awaiting trial, hanged himself also in 1996. Anna Marie still visits her mom from time to time, but has changed her name. A friend of Fred, Terrence Crick, was found dead inside his car in 1996 also, He was said to have reported suspicions of Fred to the police many times when Fred was living in the motorhome park, stating Fred asked him to find pregnant women to perform abortions on. Fred then showed him photos of women's genitalia after abortions were performed, but the police ignored his claims at the time. He was found to have committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. The West's youngest child, his name is Barry, who later stated he actually witnessed the murder of Heather. He was seven years old and said he watched Fred and Rose restrain Heather, sexually and physically assault her. Then Rose repeatedly stomped on her head until she stopped moving. Barry struggled with drug addiction for a long time after all of this and died in 2020 of an overdose. These two people deserve to be in prison forever. Fred found his way out, and thankfully, you know what? He's not here to ruin any more lives than he already did. Rose still says that she's innocent, but I mean, fuck her too. What they did was unimaginable. (sighs) That was a long one, and a hard one for sure. All of those women deserve so much more, and I'm so sorry to everyone's family who were affected by these maniacs. My thoughts and prayers are with y'all. And that was the Fred and Rose West case. Absolutely horrible. If you are still here, thank you so much for listening. Let me know of a case that you want me to cover from your country. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, download, do whatever it is you're supposed to do wherever you are listening. And thank you for coming to the morgue. Bye.